Hello friends and welcome. In this video we are going to talk about 12 things I wish I knew about emotions. Some of the questions I'm going to try and answer are what are the basic human emotions? Can my emotions affect my physical health? And how can I control my emotions? What is my emotional intelligence, EQ, and why is it important? What is the difference between emotions versus moods? So let's start with the basic human emotions. There are basically eight fundamental feelings and emotions. They are as follows. Sadness and agony. Anger. Freeze. Surprise. Fear or avoidance, as it's also known as. Disgust, contempt, and lastly, enjoyable and happy emotions. To get the complete picture of who you are, we can also sort these emotions in personality psychology. For example, in Big Five or the Hexagon model, you will find five to six personality traits, namely extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism or emotionality, openness to exploration and honesty and humility. Three out of those six personality traits are linked to human emotions. Happiness and enjoyable feelings reside in extroversion. Disgust and contempt resides in conscientiousness. And surprise, fear, avoidance, anger, sadness and agony resides in neuroticism or what is also known as emotionality. Does emotions and moods affect your physical health? Yes. Extroverts are the happiest people and they also live longer than introverts. Their reason is that introverts produce less dopamine in their brain. It is fairly easy to identify an extrovert and all people have more or less the same ability to do that. It takes only a few seconds and you see it by how much a person talks and by the movement of hands and their general ability of uh, energy output. Happiness or dopamine is also the motivational drug. You need it to motivate yourself in all sorts of different functions in life, such as talking, getting up in the morning, do the dishes, brush your teeth, taking a shower, or even cleaning your room. The opposite of positive emotions are emotionality and neuroticism. That personality traits contain all the negative emotions such as sadness, agony, freeze, surprise and fear. Neuroscientist David J. Anderson discovered that fear, along with avoidance, freeze and anger, resides in your ventricle medial hypothalamus, the VMH. It looks like a pear. Only 3,000 brain cells out of your 86 billion brain cells regulates your aggression. The VMH is located within your hypothalamus, which regulates all the other drives, such as your hunger, thirst, your sex drive, when it's time for you to go to the toilet. If you are too hot, you will motivate yourself to go to the cool down and vice versa. Contrary to what most believe about aggression, Testosterone does not trigger aggression. Triggering mechanism is in fact estrogen receptors within the BMH. So the long-held belief that testosterone makes people aggressive is wrong. It is the female sex hormone estrogen that makes humans aggressive, both physical and indirect, uh, indirect aggression. Both men and women have testosterone and estrogen, but different levels of them. As the emotion implies, emotionality is negative for the body as well. It has been documented in data, raises your blood pressure while experiencing a negative emotion. Your body does this in order to stay alert and save you. If you're high in negative emotions, you will have high blood pressure more often that will take a toll on your cardiac system, including your heart. There is some data showing that being high in neuroticism and emotionality shortens one's life due to a condition known as European heart condition. Therefore, it shortens your lifespan. A consequence of emotionality in society is what is known as cancel culture and safe spaces. Instead of exposing themselves to others, 
judgmental models of the world and others' opinions, they force others to comply with their personal negative emotions. Forcing others to tippy-toe around you so that you do not have to deal with your mental issues is called dictatorship, totalitarian and extremism. Regardless of it being a man or a woman doing it, exposure is the only human methodology that changes humans to overcome problems and different mental disorders. You can lower your negative emotions through exposure. People do this automatically throughout life. The data is clear that you are high in eroticism or emotionality as a young person. Reason being that your experience is still low, you have less memories to construct a more detailed map of the world and how to interact with it. You see young people demonstrate against war, climate change, capitalism due to the high negative emotions. But as you get older, you have exposed yourself to different things, also known as experience. Your brain will have a more detailed mental model of the world and what you can expect from it in different scenarios. Therefore, you do not worry as much. Emotionality should decrease as you age and until you turn approximately 80 years old, then we see an upwards tra trajectory of emotionality, most likely due to dementia or memory loss of being forgetful. The mismatch makes people worry since they also remember that they once could do it easier. Disgusting contempt resides in conscientiousness. This is the personality trait for being effective, keeping doing a routine, even though you do not get instant gratification in order to get a positive result in the future. The positive effect on the body is when a person is conscientious so that they exercise. Keeping to a diet that works creates a healthy routine in their lives where the byproduct is being healthy for a majority of their lifespan and therefore live longer with, with less disease. Good example is running high intensity intervals that are not pleasant once or more each week to get a VO max above 60. Those people live much longer and with less disease but it will not be fun doing it throughout your life every single week in order to live healthy and longer. You need to be conscientious for that. But if you're too high in conscientiousness, then that might lead to anorexia or bulimia or even hoarding if you're also high in eroticism. You see this in people with having gloves on because they are afraid of bacteria and viruses. It is commonly referred to as the level of disgust sensitivity. Women are a half standard deviation higher than men in general and you see this in women if you are a man easily. First a woman will look at your face, then your shoulders and then she'll look at your shoes. She's checking if your shoes are dirty or clean. It's a measurement tool for women to validate if you are a disgusting man or a clean man. Your apartment or house will most likely match your shoes and why should a woman waste their time with a disgusting man? The same goes for, uh, for men that are high in conscientiousness. They are also easily disgusted by women that are not clean. Why do we experience different emotions? From an evolutionary biological perspective, staying alive is the primary reason why your genes have survived for this long. Focusing on and having negative emotions make you survive. But in today's society, that might, might not be as needed. Negative emotions is also antisocial emotions. The opposite is being happy and extroverted, which is also the social trait. What use is this knowledge to me? If you take the big five or the hexagon test, you will have an extroversion value and an eroticism value. If you subtract the neuroticism or emotionality value from your extroversion value, you will end up with a value of your confidence. If it is a negative value, you do not have confidence in yourself. If you have a positive value, you have confidence. Depending on the size of the value, you have different levels of confidence. This you can see in yourself and in others. You can also see this shift in yourself depending on your emotions. If you're sad, you have low confidence. If you're happy, 
you have high confidence, can emotions affect physical health? You can check this yourself by taking your blood pressure when you're angry, if you remember to do so, of course. Remember that you need to have your blood pressure gauge at the same level as your heart when taking the measurement, and you cannot cross your legs or arms. You will find that it's higher than normal when under the duress of a negative emotion. Negative emotions drive what is called European heart condition, High blood pressure takes a toll on your heart, which shortens your lifespan. I hope this answers your question if you should pay attention to dealing with your negative emotions through exposure therapy or not. One of the many reasons why negative emotions are bad is because both men and women are not attracted to people having having negative emotions. Though men are more accepting than women of neuroticism or emotionality. As you can see, all your emotions have an impact on your lifespan and relationships. That is true even for the emotion of disgust. The data indicates that it is connected to conscientiousness to be successful in life. This is the trait to work on in your children and yourself. It's a byproduct of teaching your children investment theory in childhood, it is usually the person that teaches the child to do their chores before they go to bed in order for the parent to read the bedtime story. The data shows it's more the fathers than the mothers that teaches the child investment theory. The majority of mothers teaches the child consumption theory. The child negotiates with the mother to stay up longer. This results in the child staying up longer than it actually should. How to identify feelings in other people and in yourself? The easiest way to identify emotions in others is with your eyes. You will see emotions in people's faces, since feelings are connected to facial mu muscles. But you can also identify emotions in others by watching their body language. If you cross your arms or legs, you show negative emotions or avoidance of being afraid. It signals closing up to protect yourself. Two men standing parallel with shoulders straight to one another indicates aggression and hostility. If they stand at a 45 degree angle to one another, they display no emotion or aggression. On the other hand, turning away from someone is the feeling of avoidance and emotionality. You can identify emotions in others with your ears through audio. A deep voice signals power. The light voice signals frailty. A loud tone indicates awareness or hostility, and a quiet tone of voice signals vulnerability and emotionality. I think laughter speaks for itself. By closing your eyes, you can pick up people's emotions through their voices. A good thing to know about humans is that if you blindfold yourself for more than 45 minutes, your brain will increase your ability to pick up sounds and audio. This is because the part of the brain that connects to your eyes will be overtaken by the audio neurons to understand the sound coming into your ears even better. The plasticity of your brain cells repurposes your brain cells depending on the task. Th same thing happens when you go blind. You're more or less capable of picking up voices of others if they are happy, angry, scared, surprised or sad. But you might need to train a bit to heighten that functionality in you. Touch is a third way of sensing emotions. Imagine yourself being blindfolded. Imagine touching the face of a smiling person. I bet you are smiling now. This is due to your ability to visually see and construct pictures I'm painting for you with words. But imagine the hairs on the arms standing up as you touch them, or a wet tear running down a face soaking your fingertips. Your brain will then, with the help of your memory, try to identify the mo emotion. Your ability to detect emotion is not given, First, you need to establish a level of cognitive empathy and depending on your upbringing, your ability to detect, detect correct emotions in others is dependent on how you were growing up. That is why it is a good thing to first identify your level of cognitive empathy. It can easily be done with a free EQ test online. It is not as hard as you might think. Training to identify human emotions in others is easy given that you have no brain defects. 
you will improve with just a few hours worth of training and it will improve your life greatly since it is a social functionality. What is emotional intelligence EQ and why is, is it important? Emotional intelligence is empathy. Empathy divides into cognitive empathy and affective empathy. Cognitive empathy is seeing the emotions in others, either by visual uh, cues, uh, voice or touch. Affective empathy, empathy is your response to a person's emotions. And affective empathy is the mirror neurons, which are specific type of brain cells that you should have. They force you to respond to emotions identified from your cognitive empathy. Empathy is a feedback loop. It forces you to identify and mimic other people's emotions. So in a group of people, when someone is having an emotion, others will mimic so that the group feels connected and understood. That is why empathy is a social trait. Women are about 11% higher than men. More men are under 30 in empathy and autism starts from zero to 30. You can test empathy in yourself by doing the EQ test online. If you're having any concern about autism, please contact a professional licensed psychologist because I'm not. Autistic people have a low cognitive empathy. Psychopaths, Machiavellians, narcissists and sadists have low affective empathy. Therefore, they almost completely lack the ability to feel the negative emotions of a person they are hurting. Sort of not feeling your hand burning on a hot fire, even though the hand is burning up. It just doesn't work out well in life to lack the ability of that feedback loop. How do emotions work in the brain? An emotion lasts a few seconds, but can loop over and over. You feel like it's one long session of the emotion, but in fact, it comes in pulses, just like tears. Emotions are two parts, a trigger and a refractory period. Emotions last from milliseconds to a few seconds. First, you get triggered, followed by a refractory period. The refractory period will hijack your brain, it will deny you access to other memories in your brain, some even import memories to increase the emotion they are having. It is common that you import memories from another time in order to increase the emotion you are having. You have most likely experienced this in arguments during anger, and the other person will use memories from other arguments to enforce their current emotion they are having right now with other people without knowing they're doing so. It happens with all emotions subconsciously. When someone makes you happy, you can most likely remember other happy moments with others. Those memories will increase your feeling of happiness. What is the difference between emotions versus moods? Emotions is a short duration, from a millisecond to a few seconds. When the emotions have completed, you will know what the trigger was. You will know you are having an emotion or that you just had one. Emotions will create more lasting memories, but remember that emotions are not reality. Memories are not the truth of what happened, but it looks like their purpose is to make you survive and not to tell the truth. If your brain cannot access all memories in your brain, you cannot have a complete picture of what is happening. It is impossible for you to write a living memory of what happened. Same thing when you judge someone without knowing the backstory. One good example is a father staying up all night because his child is sick in the hospital. The father having to drive to work in order to pay the bills. A co-worker triggers his anger or sadness due to his lack of sleep and does not understand why the father is upset because he does not have the complete picture. Moods have the same two steps. They have a trigger and a refractory period. But moods, refractory period, lasts for up to 48 hours. Moods are subconscious. You're not aware you're having a mood, but everyone around you see that you're having a mood and which mood you're having. Bad moods get triggered from bad sleep and stress. How to control or man manage your emotions? Learning about your emotions on your own is easy. 
you can do so in order to understand them and control them. Sit down somewhere comfortable. Are you having trouble knowing what emotion you're displaying? Then sit in front of a mirror. If you want to know how the emotion feels in you before it takes over, please do the angry face and hold that angry face for 30 seconds. You will start to feel where in the body the emotion starts. You will feel it manifesting within your body. You will feel how it moves and where it resides. Do the same with the rest of the seven emotions to learn about yourself. This way, you can train yourself to react to your emotions early with cognitive behavioral techniques. You can break any emotion when needs be. Are there techniques to improve emotional well-being? Yes. Meditation or NSDR have the ability to slow down the link between the trigger and the refractory period so that you can break the link before it takes hold of you. Make sure you sleep is good and long enough will also help. Keeping away from moods, choosing friends, partners and managers carefully will help in a positive manner. Having a cold shower or ice bath for one to two minutes will produce more dopamine for a longer period of time. Good if you're an introverted personality and you will be more happy in life. Yes, this is exposure therapy and a huge part of conscientiousness. What is the link between emotion and mental health? Aggression, anger and low affective empathy is linked to psychopathy in men and women. Aggression is also indicated not needed to diagnose women with psychopathic disorder or antisocial personality disorder. High in happiness may lead to manic episodes and together with neuroticism or emotionality and the subcategory depression, it may become bipolar disease. Some combinations may, can lead to grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. Also being too high in eroticism and emotionality, and you run the risk of becoming borderline. Low affective empathy can be both psychopathy, Machiavellian, narcissism, and sadism. This can be something you were born with, or it can happen through sexual abuse during childhood, or a bilateral stroke in the insula, and other parts of the brain that regulate your affective empathy. If you're low in cognitive empathy, you might be autistic. How to deal with overwhelming emotions? Cognitive therapy is the only thing that we know works. Cognitive therapy uses exposure therapy. There is a large amount of data that supports it. The reason being that it's grounded in scientific facts that we can validate. One of the simplest methods to overcome overwhelming emotion is to amplify the emotion. Now, you might wonder if I completely lost it, but it actually works. If you're some suffering from anxiety, here is what you do. Do everything in your power to amplify your anxiety. You do that simply by telling yourself that you have anxiety. In your head, you scream, man, I'm having anxiety. Man, I'm super anxious. I'm having a panic attack. I want to have more panic. Make me more anxious. I'm super anxious. Just keep on screaming in your head so that you become more anxious. What you will notice within 10 to 30 seconds is that it goes away. Do it with stress. Man, I'm super stressed. Wow, this stress is super high. Come on, stress, make me even more stress. You will notice that the palm of your hands will dry up from sweat if you are stressed and it goes away. I have personally tried this before and during an interview. For me, it worked like a charm. The sweat on the palms of my hand dried up instantaneously during the interview. And I started during the interview having stress when the interviews started talking to each other for a minute or two, I started screaming in my head these words. And amazingly, it worked and the hands just dried up. Another good cognitive behavioral therapy trick is to say this sentence. Thank you, my subconscious, for informing me that I have a thought. But you know what? It's only a thought. The time it takes for you to speak this sentence in your head is enough to break the connection between the trigger and the refractory period. If the thought comes back, simply speak the sentence in your head again. The third cognitive trick is a mental picture in your head. I personally have a black sausage dog standing in front of my right foot. The dog has its front legs just underneath my right kneecap. It is looking up at me and smiling. Just a picture 
of that dog in my head always makes me smile and it breaks all negative emotion. It produces dopamine that balances out the negative emotions. And therefore, the picture in my head gives me confidence and all the negative emotions goes away. What about lies and emotions? Can you tell if someone is lying? I am sorry, but you cannot do that. There are in fact no scientific way of determining if someone is lying. They have to confess to you that they are lying and what they're lying about. Some of you think you are good at telling if someone is lying. But from a scientific point of view, you cannot tell if someone is lying. You need to verify it and you do that by their confession. We are of course not talking about seeing someone taking the last cookie than telling you they did not. Then you already know the truth. I'm talking about when you have no idea the other person is in fact lying to you and you don't know anything about it. There are two typical mistakes people make when trying to identify a lie. It's the Othello error, which is disbelieving a truthful person. You accuse someone of lying and see the person scared or nervous. You then take that as admission of guilt and that your statement is accurate, when in fact it's a display of an emotion and not a confession. The second one is the Brokaw hazard. It is when someone thinks they are good at telling lies. By thinking you are good at telling if people are lying, you will miss obvious things and cues. Skilled liars practice their lies. They do it to look super confident. If there are no cues that suggest some kind of deception, you will not react and ask more questions. That is why they slip under the radar. This is shown in re recent scientific experiments where Machiavellians and narcissists are sincere, but not honest. Sincere is believing your lies and speaking about them in a confident manner. A great example is someone telling you that they did not take the last cookie with a straight face. Remember that in the cookie example, the person might be ashamed of his or her body and therefore always act stressful when talking about food. You might interpret that as the Othello error in that the stressful response is an admission of guilt, which is not. In some cases, a liar shows contempt right after they told the lie, they think you're a sucker for believing them. Remember that a sign of contempt is not an admission of guilt, only that you have determined that they had just a feeling of contempt. They might have a feeling of, of contempt towards themselves or you. To understand yourself and others, who to have a relationship with, go watch the video of understand your basic personality. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for more content and I will see you in the next video.